my God! Okay, it's happening. Everybody stay calm. Hi, I'm Lady Genevieve, and on my channel I like to talk about entertainment media. I wasn't going to film on a Friday. I had it written in my planner that I would film two new videos on Saturday, one for the channel and one for my Patreon, but then Netflix decided to wake everyone up by dropping new Bridgerton promo. They said February is Valentine's Day season, so let's not waste any time. Furthermore, they also shared that they will be doing a virtual first look at season three on the 14th, Valentine's Day, and yes, I already RSVP'd. I'm assuming all of you did as well, unless the timing of that event conflicts with something else you have going on at the same time. This morning, Kimiko-chan had a veterinary appointment, so revenue from this month's videos will be going towards that. It's been a while since she had a cameo, so I decided to bring her back now. So please validate her with your undivided attention. When I tell you that Bridgerton has been monopolizing the vast majority of my video planning energy, I really mean that. I had one topic I was going to do that I've been meaning to do for what, two years now? Basically ever since season two aired, that Bridgerton video has been on my to-do list. Let's call that one topic A. And then over on my Patreon, we've been doing Netflix teleparty watch parties for Bridgerton basically every other week in order to count down to season three premiering. We're halfway through season one right now, but doing that rewatch sparked another video idea, so we will call that one topic B, which I decided to do first before topic A. And then Netflix dropped new promo February 1st, and they've got more coming on the 14th, so I suppose that's topic C and D. Is this what Violet Bridgerton felt like popping out all of those letters of the alphabet? No, but I'm only kidding, of course. Kimiko is an only child. This is her home, and I just live in it. Your eyes. The most remarkable shade of blue. Swollen. New Bridgerton promo. It's a clip of our main couple of this season, Colin and Penelope. It's barely clocking in at about 30 seconds, so it's more of a whisper of a thrill than anything. Nonetheless, I found plenty in this clip to dissect. I'm assuming most of you watching this video already saw how much I managed to say just from looking at promotional images of season three and analyzing them in my previous Bridgerton video. Before we jump into everything though, I will remind all of you to please not spoil things from books three onward. I read the books after their respective seasons air on Netflix. The only way that I would consider making an exception to this admittedly self-imposed policy is if someone decides to let me do a long one-on-one -on -one interview with Luke Thompson about Benedict, then maybe I would consider reading Benedict's book first. If you saw my junket interviews for Anyone But You with Glenn Powell, Sidney Sweeney, and director Will Gluck, you should already be aware of how hard I go with doing preparations when you give me something that I really, really want. By the way, I've seen Anyone But You nine times at the cinema, and I will definitely be hitting double digits because they are doing an extended release in cinemas next week, February 9th. I know there's going to be stuff they deleted in editing because why are Glenn and Sydney in a sports arena during the final musical number when we didn't see any scenes of them there during the original theatrical cut? Exactly. Something's happening. Bridgerton season three, Penelope and Colin. There's no way you're watching this video without having watched the clip first, so I'm not going to overly explain that. We're just going to jump into talking about very various details of it. Like I talked about in my previous Bridgerton video, we see Penelope wearing a lot more blue and bluish clothing this season. Blue is a signature color for the Bridgerton family, so it's a way of visually communicating her shift towards her endgame, which is of course to join the Bridgerton family and get the man. Building off of that point, I like how the detailing on Penelope's dress in some ways seems to match Colin's waistcoat. There's this very noticeable floral print detailing on his vest. I do not have Colin's wardrobe memorized from the entire show thus far, nor do I have the vast majority of the male characters' wardrobe on this show memorized because in general I think the women have much more visually appealing and interesting outfits than the men do. But if I'm not completely misremembering, I don't know if I've ever seen Colin wear anything all that flashy before this. This waistcoat feels like it pops a lot more. I think this makes sense to do because the two of them are the main couple of this season, so you want them to visually pop a bit more in a general sense on screen. But there's also this sense of wanting to see a visual will glow up for both of them because we've been following them for two entire seasons thus far and there has been a certain level of character immaturity they've exhibited before this point so a visual glow up can be a way of consciously or subconsciously accentuating to the audience both an external and internal progression for them as characters. Having their outfits match we have to presume that from the point of view of the characters it's something happening unintentionally. They're not consciously trying to get with each other romantically at this point in the scene. 
But the wardrobe department, they're absolutely going to make them visually match so that we as the audience, we can watch them and feel even more justified in our outbursts where we yell at the screen, can you two please stop the games and just get together already? How are you being this obtuse? But that's part of the fun, you know, the characters are endgame, but the characters don't know that they're endgame. Are you out of your mind? She wants you. Okay, don't. Don't do that. Speaking further about appearance, I really need to emphasize how good Penelope's new wig is. I remember Nicola saying in an interview that she had been given a new upgraded wig for season three, and it's so apparent. Even when I looked up this clip on YouTube, you have this point of comparison readily available because the video that pops up directly underneath this new clip in the search engine, the hairline is different. Not in the sense of where the hairline sits on her face, but the quality of the wig itself, it's just very noticeable that the new wig is giving what needs to be given. Now the old wig was not horrible, but it just, it looked like a wig. This new wig, if I didn't already know who Nicola Coughlin was, you could tell me this was her hair and I could believe it. I would be like, oh yeah, she's Irish and ginger. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. That actually reminds me, I've come to this realization recently where I have a headcanon that I don't need any of you to agree with and most of you will not because it's so extra and unnecessary, but that's all right, I'll share it anyway. Penelope Featherington, is Irish, Penelope O. Featherington. And I don't just come to that conclusion based on Nicola being Irish, though the red hair does give me a point in my favor. We saw Penelope last season, season two, sneaking around to do her Lady Whistledown operation. And whilst doing so, she spoke in an Irish accent to disguise herself. Not only that, but a perfect Irish accent. Why exactly would Penelope O. Featherington somehow magically speak with a perfect Irish accent? That family is broke and you want me to believe what? They've got a summer home in Ireland? When have we ever seen Penelope meeting Irish people? She's not getting tutored by Irish people or being given drama lessons to learn how to do other accents. I know Nicola is Irish, so that's why she can do the accent. But what reason within the show's canon is there for Penelope O. Featherington to be able to do an Irish accent? I don't know the reason or the backstory, but I know the conclusion of my head canon, which is that Penelope O. Featherington is Irish and I will not be told otherwise. As always, we will be supporting Ireland and Irish excellence. I rest my case. So so good luck England, or as we say in Ireland, Chucky our law. The thing about the way this new promo clip starts is that these Netflix publicity people, they decided to just pick up the fandom and drop us in the middle of the ocean to fend for ourselves. Where is Pyacon to rescue me because I can't swim? I'm just being left here to flail, trying to not get devoured by sharks, or as they're also known, royalists. The scoring of this clip was interesting though because that just compounded the impact of the dialogue itself. It was a context clue that we were being dropped into the middle of a situation. With a scene like this, what I can presume is that the part of this conversation that leads up to this moment that we are able to watch would either have no scoring at all or scoring that has a different emotional tone. But the clip we're being shown, we're hearing this score that would have either presumably been gradually faded into or scoring that would have gradually shifted from one emotional tone to the one that we hear in this clip. I have not read the book, but I can still extrapolate from this and other context clues about the dialogue itself, the scoring, that he's coaching her about how to speak to potential suitors. And when she takes the advice and executes it a little too well, he's shaking, quaking, screaming, crying himself to sleep for fumbling the love of his life. Men are so embarrassing. Honestly. Another context clue leading me to my conclusion is the types of shots that we have of the two of them. The camera is either much physically closer to them or the lens has been zoomed in enough to have it be sitting somewhere in the range of a medium close up and a close up. But then when the tension of the moment breaks and they're back to being awkward, it jumps back to more of a medium long shot. So as you build that tension of pushing them together for this exchange, the shots begin to move in closer on them. Think back to season two when Kate and Anthony had the B scene, which is still so iconic. I wish I could go back in time and watch it again for the first time because I was entirely unprepared for what was about to happen when watching that scene. In that scene though, when the intensity got cranked up, the shots moved in closer. We had close-ups on their faces, close-ups of her holding his hand over her heart, all of that. Now, if you're not already familiar with these more technical aspects of the language of film and filmmaking, there you go. So you can keep an eye out as we hope 
hopefully, presumably get more promotions starting to roll out this month. They have to release something on February 14th. There's just no way they can play in our faces after how floptastic the last Tadam was, and it was obvious why they were holding everything back. The strikes were going to happen, and they didn't know how long they were going to have to delay new releases, and they wanted to time the promotional rollouts to coincide with whatever the release dates would end up being. But to that point, I will just say, maybe if you had bothered to compensate your workers fairly in the first place, there wouldn't have been any strikes that needed to happen in the first place. Quick point of feedback, the mouth noises, the coughing, scoffing, grunting, so funny. I love that. Mm. Um. Um. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> I don't think we talk enough about the comedic value of mouth noises. I'm not talking about speaking. I'm talking about all the other types of noises an actor can make to express themselves when they're acting in character. There's something I've watched kind of recently that I can't talk about right now because embargoes are a thing, but the mouth noises in the thing that I watched, 11 out of 10. We'll put that topic of conversation on pause until the embargo for that lifts. So if you are subscribed to my channel, you should see me talk about whatever that is when the time comes. Now, like I've already said, I have not read Colin and Penelope's book. If Netflix gives me press screeners to review season three, I will read their book after I watch my screeners. I'm assuming at some point though, Colin is going to find out about Penelope being Lady Whistledown. And when Penelope drops this line, yet somehow they shine even brighter when you are kind. Miss Penelope O. Featherington has a way with words and you really couldn't tell that she was Lady Whistledown? Name one other person that you know, Colin, that has the wordplay to write all that gossip and make it sound convincing when narrated by Julie Andrews. Exactly, that's what I thought. Colin Bridgerton, AKA Mr. No Thoughts Head Empty. You're not very pretty and you're not very bright. And before any of you Colin stands try to come for me for once again pulling out the Jennifer Coolidge clip, the Bridgertons are generationally wealthy landlords. They've taken more than their fair share of what's fair. So they for damn sure can take a joke. I really like this compliment Penelope gives him though. I know it's only one line, but it somehow manages to stand out in a really big way, not just for the clip itself or the multi-season arc we followed for these two characters. I'm speaking more so about being a romance fiction fan, watching my fair share of rom-coms, watching my fair share of romance films, good and bad, reading an obscene amount of AO3. There are certain compliments you get used to hearing or reading. Something about the way Penelope does a fusion of complimenting Colin physically, because let's be so real, that compliment was inspired by and directed at Colin, but also complimenting an internal quality of his. Oh, that's the fusion I didn't know I needed until right now, this very moment. Also, I've I already made it clear, but I'll say it again. I really, really like Nicola Coughlin. She's such a great actress. So it's a treat to get to see her stretch different acting muscles for this character. We really get to follow the transformation and evolution of Penelope. And we know Nicola is going to deliver the goods. I'm also happy that Nicola is not a coward and that she stands on the correct side of history. So I will say it again, like I did in my prior Bridgerton video, donation links to different organizations and causes to help Palestinians will be in my description box. Those donation links are staying in there, even in videos I upload where I'm not explicitly mentioning them, but just know that they're there. I feel like a show like Bridgerton is so aesthetically pleasing with the way that it's filmed, these gorgeous costumes, the scenic locations, all of that. So telling Colin she finds him physically attractive on its own wouldn't be nearly as exciting as what Penelope O. Featherington said to him. Yeah, that's her new name now. Don't correct me. We are no longer English washing her. I like that her emphasis on finding Colin's kindness attractive has so many facets to it. For one, I tend to find it very unappealing that there's this toxicity to a lot of heteronormative relationship dynamics and relationship tropes that we often see in fiction. Sometimes it's fun to watch a couple bicker on screen, but a lot of fiction takes that bickering too far and pushing the notion that if a man is mean, that's supposed to somehow be attractive or that it's an indication that he likes you. How about you grow up and have emotional maturity instead of acting like a toddler? But also, Penelope would value kindness she likes the Bridgerton family because they love each other. You see the playful bickering among them, especially among this enormous pack of children, but it's always evident that there's this really deep love there. And if I were to speculate, I think Penelope's many years of having a crush on Colin, I don't think it's 
only Colin. I think it's the full fantasy of being with Colin and becoming a Bridgerton because patriarchal name change customs and getting to be a part of a family where love is apparent and abundant. But we saw in season one that exchange where Cressida was rude to Penelope right in front of Colin and then she tried to get Colin to dance with her and Colin opted instead to dance with Penelope. That was an act of kindness. That's what Penelope wants. I'm afraid I cannot offer you that dance, Miss Cowper. I am to escort Miss Featherington to the floor. I love that you want to walk outside with me. That's also why Colin being so foul in the season two finale would hurt. That's not who she thought he was, and that's not what she was attracted to, and that's not what she wants from a man. Are you mad? I would never dream of courting Penelope Featherington. Not in your wildest fantasies, Fife. It, it, the f it, flame, flames, flames on the side of my face. But I knew who they were, and I told her who they were. Shitheads. In a way, though, the petty side of me likes to hear her say this line she says of how his eyes shine even brighter when he's kind. I would love it if there was some passive aggression simmering deep beneath the surface of that. I hope she brings up what he said to her because he needs to apologize and he needs to grovel. Get down on your knees and tell me you love me. I love you. Oh, but wait, what if she tells him, I heard what you said, you odious man, and he gets all embarrassed and apologetic, as he should be, and that's why he offers to help her find a man. If that's literally the plot of the book, don't tell me. And if it's not the plot of the book, don't tell me. Those are my thoughts on this first bit of Colin and Penelope footage. What are your thoughts? Will you be attending the Valentine's Day virtual event for Netflix's Bridgerton? Let me know. How much life did you get from the upgraded wig Miss Penelope O. Featherington? is wearing. Let me know in the comments and stay tuned because a new video should be coming up in less than a week from when I publish this when an embargo may or may not be lifting. A new Bridgerton video will presumably come once I've seen whatever new stuff will be coming on Valentine's Day. Bye!